This week, we are going to be reading the story Valley of the Moon. As you read, I want you to think about the essential question. Why is it important to keep a record of the past? In this story, you're going to read how a diary becomes a refuge for an orphan girl. Remember, the purpose for this week is going to be theme, the message that the author is trying to teach you. It's a life lesson that the author is trying to teach you. So think about what you could learn from this girl and her experiences. Valley of the Moon. Orphaned at an early age, Maria Rosalia and her younger brother Domingo were raised by Padre Ignacio at the Mission Rafael in Alta, California. Now the children have become servants at the Medina Rancho. Taught to read and write by Padre Ignacio, Maria Rosalia has recently started keeping a diary about her life at the rancho. October 10th, 1845. Tonight, I begin my first diary. The Medina family is asleep and all is quiet throughout the rancho. Only the wind racing around the corners of the adobe house and the distant yelp of coyotes break the night silence. I am snuggled in a corner of the kitchen surrounded by baskets of dried corn waiting to be ground. The tile floors feel cold on my bare feet, but I do not mind for I know no one will find me here. This diary is mine because the eldest of the Medina daughters, Miguela, tossed it over her balcony into the courtyard. My fingers quickly rescued it from the watery death in the fountain. Senorita Miguela threw it away in a fit of resentment after it was given to her by an American suitor, Senor Henry Johnston. With flashing black eyes, she cried out that a girl has no more use for reading and writing than a snake has for gold earrings. She said the diary was an insult to her beauty and charm. Then, Toss in your Johnston's Johnson out too. I feel sorry for Senor Johnston, or for any man who has the misfortune of courting headstrong Miguela. But I am not sorry that I now hold her discarded diary in my hands. I must let anyone I must not let anyone see me writing, for I am a servant a half Indian orphan, a girl. I am supposed to know nothing but work and obedience. How amazed the Medinas would be if they knew I learned to read and write from a kind old padre at Mission Rafael, many miles from here. Maybe someday I will tell them. October 11th. I've been thinking about Padre Ignacio all day. It was he who found Domingo and me eight years ago beside our dying mother in the Rose Garden of Mission Rafael near San Francisco Bay. Her body was ravaged with smallpox and I had placed roses over her face. I think I was about five years old and my brother was about two, but no one knows our ages for sure. Padre Ignacio named me Maria Rosalia after the Blessed Virgin and because of the roses. He named my brother Domingo because it was a Sunday morning. For a last name, he called us Milagros, for it was a miracle indeed that we did not die of the horrible plague that claimed the lives of so many Indians in Alta, California. They say that out of 40,000 Suan's people, only 200 lived. Some smaller tribes lost everyone. How Domingo and I survived is one of the many mysteries of my life. When Padre Ignacio found us, we did not speak much Spanish and he did not know our Indian dialect. But one thing he was sure, though our mother had the bronze skin of an Indian, our skin was the light brown of mestizos, half Indian and half Spanish. It was obvious that our father had been a white man. Whether he was a wealthy Spanish landowner, a Spanish soldier from the Presidio at San Francisco, 
a Russian fur trapper, or an American merchant sailor. No one knows. Lupita, the cook, is the closest thing to a mother I have. Her husband, Gregorio, is the head vaquero on the ranch. He oversees the men who tend the cattle and horses. It was Gregorio who found me and Domingo at Mission Rafael four years ago and brought us to live at the Medina Ranch, Rancho Agua Verde. Lupita and Gregorio have no children of their own, but have raised several orphans. I know they care about me, yet my heart feels empty. If I do not know my past, how can I plot my future? I must stop thinking such things and get back to work. If I don't finish grinding this corn, there will be no tortillas tomorrow. Sunday, October 12th. I have no place to hide this diary. Right, my room in the servants' quarters is so tiny that I can hardly turn around. I share it with Ramona, the seamstress. We sleep on woven straw pallets on the floor and roll them up each morning. We, turks, we take turns sitting on one chair at the one tiny table. Whoever doesn't get the chair sits on an overturned wooden bucket. The adobe walls and ceiling are stained with black soot from the fireplace and tallow candles. But our quarters are not as bleak as some. Ramona saves scraps of cloth from the sewing projects. Our walls are alive with color, a wool tapestry, one finely embroidered hanging that depicts the Holy Virgin, and another hanging that shimmers with flowers. Even our floor has a wool rug made of remnants from the spring sheep's shearing. Pegs line the walls for our, spa our sparse clothing. Baskets hang from the heavy timber beams for food and miscellaneous items. It is better than the room I shared with four other orphans at Mission Rafael. October 13th. The Medina daughter saw me in the courtyard today carrying the diary. Miguela was amused and said I could keep it. Perhaps she might use it for fire kindling, Rosa, she said with a toss of her black curls. Miguela is 17 and has been available for marriage for two years. She is a great beauty, but has ignored all the men who call on her as she, and has refused, refused several proposals. If I were rich, I would pay a man every peso I own to take her away from this ranch. Rafaela, the middle daughter, who is aged 15, is gentle and sweet, but very sickly. She coughs often, and her skin is paler than white lilies. She told Miguela not to be so unkind, because I am more like family than a servant. Bless her soul. How I wish her words were true. Gabriela, who is 11 and like a little sister to me, said to just ignore Miguela. Everyone knows how Miguela is, but her words stung. October 14th. I am in the goat pen seizing a moment to write in my diary. I milk the goats faster than lightning so that I might have a free moment. I carry the diary with me at all time, tied to my waist with a sash and hidden under my skirt. I dare not write at night in my room for Ramona is a light sleeper. I have no ink, so I'm using beet juice. It leaves an uneven pale red color, but it must do until I find real ink. For a pen, I am using a sharpened black feather from the tail of a paladin, Senor Medina's favorite fighting rooster. Domingo stole the feather from the chicken coop and gave it to me. All I think of while doing chores in the moment, I will open. All I think of while doing chores is the moment I will open this diary and write. It is my island of refuge in a sea of work. October 15th. Senor Johnston is here again. I like him very much. He speaks to me kindly and does not order me around. He owns a merchant business in the small town of Yerba Buena on San Francisco Bay, south of here. Being 28 years of age and settled, he is now looking for a wife. He has decided upon Senorita Miguela. 
may heaven help him, and has visited Rancho Agua Verde many times this year. Senor Johnston is waiting for his brother and family who are coming by wagon train from Missouri to join him in California. They will arrive first at Sutter's Fort in the Sacramento Valley, where Johnston will go to meet them. A few years ago, there were very few foreigners in, Ad in Alta, California, just some sailors and fur trappers. Now they come in a steady stream, mostly farmers from Missouri. There are hundreds of them, especially in the Sacramento Valley, northeast of here. Lupita does not trust the North Norte Americanos. She says they are supposed to become loyal Mexican citizens, learn to speak Spanish, and become Catholics in exchange for land, but not all of them do as they agreed. She especially dislikes the foreigner, Johan Sutter, who encourages other foreigners to come to California illegally without permission from the Mexican government. There are already squatters on Senor Medina's land. Lupita thinks they will take over Alta California below, before long. I do not care what Lupita says. I like Senor Johnston, even if he is an Americano. He is beside himself with excitement about his brother's arrival, but he is worried. The snows will soon start to fall on top of the Sierra Nevada mountains to the east, causing deep drifts and icy rocks that make the passes treacherous to cross. If the Johnston family does not clear the mountains by the end of this month, they are surely doomed. October 16th. Spent a pleasant morning working in the courtyard that is surrounded by the thick walls of the Casa Grande on four sides. I wonder if the Medina house will ever be completed. Every year, the Indian workers add a bit more. When the main house was first built, it was a simple one-story structure like nearly all the ranchos in Northern Alta, California. But after Senora Medina and Miguela saw the grand rancho that General Baello was building in Petaluma a few miles away, they insisted on having a second story with balconies and rambling rose vines. At the moment, only the Medina family has upstairs bedrooms with balconies. Everyone else, servants and guests alike, sleeps downstairs. I do not mind for walking up and downstairs makes my legs ache. Drew 10 buckets of water from the well to tend the herbs, beans, squash, pumpkins, melons, onions, and hot chiles in the garden near the kitchen door. Swept the veranda that is roofed with brown clay tiles prune the rambling Castilian roses that climb up the post to the upstairs bedroom balconies, picked late maturing pears from Senor Medina's cherished fruit trees. I am tired, but am writing during siesta while everyone else rests. Writing brings me more joy than sleep. Nothing would make me happier than to write all day and all night. October 17th, Madre Mia, my secret is uncovered. While I was in the courtyard writing in my diary today, Senor Johnston appeared out of nowhere. I was afraid he would be angry that I had it. But his large blue eyes grew wide like an owl's. He said to me in his best Spanish, which I'm sorry to say is not very good, Rosalia, I cannot believe you are writing. How did you learn such skills? I begged Johnston not to tell anyone, for it would only mean trouble for me. I explained how Padre Ignacio taught the Indian boys at Mission Rafael to read and write. He let me sit quietly at the back of the room, and I helped Domingo, who detested lessons and being indoors. The California missions were closing down anyway and the padre did not care if the rules said girls did not need an education. He said if the girl wanted to read and write, he would not stop her. He was very generous and tolerant when it came to the mission in the Os. Johnston was so astonished that he dug into his leather saddlebag and handed me a bottle of ink, a very nice brass point, 
and two turkey quills. Now the ink flows onto the pages almost as fast as I think of words. And that is the end of our story. So again, I want you to be able to think about how does the author use Maria Rosalia's diary entries to help you learn about her character and what's important to her? And what life lesson is this author trying to teach you? Okay.